Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of the new screensavers is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Hands on with the new Microsoft Surface Laptop, Apple's 10 and a half inch iPad Pro, and Sphero's Spider-Man. Live from the Twit Eastside Studios in beautiful Petaluma, it's the new screensavers. <laughs> This is the new Screensavers, episode 109, recorded Friday, June 16th, 2017. I'm Nathan Olivares Giles. I'm Scott Wilkinson. And uh, Leo Laporte's on vacation, so we're filling in here today. I'm super excited to be on the show with you, Scott. We're going to have a lot of home theater mm -hmm. questions, and you are the man. You are the expert on that. Sure, so happy we're definitely to be here gonna answer for that. It. Yeah. yeah. And getting uh, later in the show, we're going to get uh, a great interview with Sphero, the folks behind some of these these tech toys uh, a little voice control here for spider-man recently we took a look at lightning mcqueen oh, from cards pretty interactive really cool that looks really cool and we're going to talk a little bit about the future of tech toys mm -hmm. and also privacy and data what it means when kids are actually talking to their toys and their toys can talk back uh, we're also going to have a hands-on with this windows this new windows laptop here looks pretty slick looks pretty slick and megan roney is going to give us a early look at the iPad Pro 10 and a half inch, mm. big, bigger screen, same size body, mm. so that's gonna be good stuff. Yeah. Um, and a lot more goodness after that, but let's start with some hot topics. Let's start with the news. Um, and there's plenty of that, isn't there? There's, there's plenty of that. So <laughs> since, since you're a home theater guy, yeah. I, I wanna start with E3. Microsoft announced the <laughs> Xbox One X, mm -hmm. which the internet was pretty much lampooning them for what is arguably a terrible name. But what matters here, <laughs> What matters here is the price point and the power. They say it's going to be 40% more powerful than any other console that's out there. Mm -hmm. It's also going to be 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, the bottom lines here are that it's going to do native, it, it can do native 4K gaming, mm -hmm. and that it'll be able to do HDR gaming. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, that $500 price point. Sony's competitor, which came out a year ago, the PlayStation 4 Pro, it can do native 4K gaming, but uh, most of the games that it's shown so, so far with capabilities for the Pro are using what's called checkerboard rendering. So it's basically upscaling 1080p, uh, 1080p content. Mm -hmm. And it'll do HDR too. Right, and the, the Xbox X will do this, the Xbox One X will do the same thing. The question is how many games are optimized for that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, on the PS4 Pro, I mean, I don't know. I'm on not the, really a on gamer. On the PS4 Pro, there are already a couple dozen games that have been optimized for Pro. Okay. And in both with the Pro and the Xbox One X, it's going to be a bit of a developer's choice. Do you want to spend your resources on HDR? Do you want to spend them on 4K? If so, what kind of 4K? Native 4K? Hmm. Checkerboard? Some other type of upscaling? And do you want to spend your money or your budget on uh, 60 frames per second, for example? Exactly. Frame rate is a big deal. Yeah. And so, so far, most games aren't offering that magical combo <laughs> of native 4K, 60 frames per second, and HDR. Which is going to tax even the, the hardware of the oh, Xbox yeah. One X, which is more powerful than the PS4 Pro, exactly. anything that's come before it. Yeah, it's interesting. These are kind of, both the PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox One X are updates in the middle of the life cycle of a console. Normally, mm -hmm. you'd buy a console, it'd be good for about 10 years, right? right? Now they're kind of shortening that. The idea is you'll be spend that money about every four or five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe in part to keep up with the techno technology advancements we have here, but this is a little bit of future-proofing because most people don't yet have 4K and HDR TVs, right? So if you buy one of these, you know it's gonna work. But I gotta ask you, since you know, since this is your domain, if if I own a 4K HDR TV or if I don't have one yet, <coughs> what should be my thought process into deciding if I want to make the leap and upgrade from an existing console? Because it's worth noting the existing Xbox One X 
and the existing PlayStation 4 uh, regular, non-pro, mm. they'll both do HDR. Mm. And I feel like HDR, for me, in my testing, um, that's more noticeable no to my eye than the 4K, whether it's native or checkerboard or whatever. Absolutely, no question about it. Uh, you put, I've put many times a 1080p versus a 4K side by side. In terms of pixel resolution, you really can't see much difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As, at least at a normal seating distance. Yeah. You, know, you get close up, sure. Yeah. You can see and this is difference. stuff you're playing in your living room. You're not right. sitting in front of a big monitor at your right. desk the way you would with a PC. Exactly, exactly. So I agree with you 100%. HDR, high dynamic range, yeah. is so much more important, makes so much more of a difference mm -hmm, to the mm -hmm. way the image looks, not only on games, but for me, more importantly, movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just it blows more resolution away. So yeah. I certainly would want to see that as a gamer. I would want to see more HDR. Yeah, and actually I'm glad you brought up movies because the Xbox One X has a Blu-ray 4K HDR disc optical drive, right. whereas the PlayStation 4 Pro Does only not. has regular Blu-ray right. and regular, so it's going to be maxing out at 1080p. So That's right. if you're into on-disc, you know, I know a lot of people are going towards streaming, but if you want that... 4K Blu-ray, that's only really going to give you everything you want on the Xbox One X or that's the correct. Xbox One S. Right. The S also has the UHD yep. Blu-ray player yep. with HDR. And, it, and that's only 200 bucks instead of 500 <laughs> so. I was I was interested that the Xbox One S was a, introduced at first at 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. And They've brought the, it down the, quite a bit. They did because the sales, I heard, I yeah, read yeah. a couple of reports saying that the sales weren't very good yeah. at that price. Well, well, Sony has sold about twice as many PlayStations as Microsoft has for Xboxes in this whole life cycle. So mm -hmm. all of the Xbox Ones, there's been three variants of them so far, yeah. and all of the PlayStations. Yeah. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about Amazon oh, buying man. Whole Foods for $13.4 billion. Cash. Cash. <laughs> and, and, and Amazon stock, I don't know what it looks like now, but maybe about an hour ago, it jumped it so jumped high. It jumped up. actually more than the price of this deal. Yep. And in fact, a lot of folks are making the joke uh, online that Jeff Bezos ended up buying Whole Foods for free because of that stock <laughs> increase, which is pretty funny. But you know, what do you, what do you think about this? Does this make sense for Amazon? <clears throat> well, it does, certainly given that, that they want to start you know, drone delivery. Yeah, yeah, they've been talking and about that for a long time. They've been talking about that for a long time. There is a, an uptick, I think, in the whole movement toward delivering food yeah. to the home. Yeah. Right, so this kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and all of these stores, I mean, Whole Foods isn't a typical grocery store chain, no, right? No. This is not, you know, everywhere bargain basement prices. This is it's in pretty a expensive. lot of, it's, yeah, it's pricey, it's in a lot of uh, urban centers, mm -hmm. it's in high income neighborhoods, mm -hmm. it's a fancy grocery store, right? It is. So and they're, if, pr they're, pr they're getting pretty widespread. I mean, yeah. I've got uh, three within easy drive of my house. Yeah, and we've seen- And they're, they're building one in my, in my town. Oh, so are they? Okay. I'm gonna be able to walk to it. Well, and, well <laughs> walk or drone, I guess you might have the choice. Yeah, enough. right. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how ambitious they get with this purchase. We don't wanna put any words in Jeff Bezos' mouth here. Right, but right. at the same time, you know, with this, we've seen studies that say, you know, higher income levels, they're more likely to be prime subscribers. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to be buying things mm -hmm. on Amazon rather mm -hmm. than going to a brick and mortar store. Oh, yeah. But what does this, do you think, say about the need for a brick and mortar presence for a company that is, you know, there, you can't get more digital first than Amazon. Really, well, that's know? true. I have to say I'm really mixed about it. Um, I mean, certainly the convenience of shopping on Amazon. I'm yeah. a Prime member. Yeah. You know, when I buy stuff on Amazon, it shows up at my door. It's really great. It's pretty lovely. You know, it really is. But when I'm shopping for produce, yeah. I actually want to go and pick out the produce. Yeah. I don't want somebody else to pick it out for me. And maybe I'm old-fashioned about that, but... Well, it's interesting. Warby Parker, uh, which is you yeah. know, kind of at the cutting edge of online sales, got all the the you know hipster branding that you could want. They're opening, glasses. yeah, for for glasses. They sell glasses on, online. They'll send you some so you can try them out at your home. Yeah, they're actually opening more brick and mortar stores for that Are very reason. Really? People want to try them on. Well, they glasses, go and touch stuff. Yeah. you know, that's a very personal thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I certainly wouldn't buy glasses, just like I wouldn't buy a musical instrument without trying, without playing it first. Exactly, exactly. Same kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. Interesting move 
moves here. Um, we're going to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode before we get into the rest. Sounds Again, like a good idea to me. Yeah, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up. You know, Sphero, you know, iPads, uh, new laptops. We're going to get into all that. But first, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode, and that is Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple and allows you to fully understand all the details so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's also convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify, and then you can find the one that's right just for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, and mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com NSS. That's rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of the new screensavers. All right, so um, now we are going to speak... What? <laughs> All right. What? Well, we actually got Spider-Man chiming in here. All right. A, f a few weeks ago, I actually reviewed the Ultimate Lightning McQueen by Sphero, um, and and this uh, Lightning McQueen, I actually turned off the app for this one, so he wouldn't be talking as Spider-Man is right now. Yeah, really. <laughs> but it basically like moves animatronically. We can show a little bit of uh, of my review of that, but it's it's an amazing toy, and it really makes Lightning McQueen feel like he is alive. That like is straight really out of the movie. cool, man. Yeah, that is really cool. I mean, it, it captures the f the feel, the look of Lightning McQueen. Yeah, it's like you jumped right out of the screen. Now, yeah. uh, Sphero, the company behind this, uh, they've been making tech infused toys for you know maybe more than five years now. Mm -hmm. Their namesake ball, it's like this little rolling ball you could control with your phone. That's where they started, and they've been continually updating their apps with more and more games to play, uh, more cool features, and uh, opening it up to coding as well. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So open source kind of thing? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's open source, but we'll <coughs> actually be able to ask Ryan Burnett, a product Let's manager do. for Sphero, that question. Hey, Ryan. Hey guys, how's it going? Pretty good, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it here. So you got a lot of good stuff going. Um, this Spider-Man toy is the newest Sphero product. Um, and as, as we heard here, I'll turn his volume back up. You can turn his volume down in the app. Um, but this, this is unlike any Spider-Man toy that I've seen before uh, because, of, because of what you guys have done in infusing him with so many different features here. Um, in fact, you can pr tell me a joke. Go after committing a crime. I'm not sure. Where do you go, Spider Man? Prism. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can, he tells a lot of dad jokes. I, I think that's pretty great. Um, and then there are also voice controls for uh, little imaginary stories where he's telling you about fighting supervillains and all kinds of cool stuff. Wow. Um, let's talk about this. W where did the idea for Sphero getting into this come from? Sure. I mean, basically, we're trying to build the toys that we wish we had when we were kids. <laughs> um, there's a lot of technology that's available to us today that, you know, that, you know, at a price that we can, you know, start utilizing it in these toys. And we're really just, you know, we're, we're dreaming up the, this, you know, the Spider-Man action figure that we wish we had, or we pretended that we had when we were kids. So um, <laughs> it's really, an, it, it, the way that I think about it is it's an action figure that, that comes to life in a lot of different ways. Um, with the built-in accelerometer, the content, the embedded speech recognition, the eyes, we just we're just really trying to bring characters to life, and that's kind of been the heart of of this project in particular. And you know, we're we've been excited to see it develop over the last 16 months, and really stoked to get it out into the wild and see what people think about it. So now I'm kind of curious, uh, how much, if any, artificial intelligence is built into this? Sure. Um, I like to think of it as just intelligence because <laughs> <laughs> good point. We're, really building, um, we're building smart, connected devices, and with Spider-Man in particular, I've had you know that that's been kind of 
uh, the project that I've been super invested in in the last year and a half, and we've done you know everything we can to build in things like, you know, he he remembers um, where you left off. He remembers uh, answers to questions that he's asked you you know months before. He knows what time it is. He knows what day it is. He knows what month it is. Um, if you ask him how's school and it's June, he'll be like, "What are you talking about?" It's June and I'm not in summer school. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we really, you know, we're we've really tried to try to build a lot of stuff in there where it, it truly is smart and it truly is intelligent. And so, um, I'd say there's there's quite a lot. And the way that we build the architecture of the system really leaves it open and dynamic. So we can um, we can tweak it and we can change it and we can. Uh, you know, build upon it as the product kind of evolves. And I, I really think that that's what makes it special is when you unbox this thing and start playing with it, that's really the beginning of a, of a relationship. And, and we're really looking forward to seeing that develop. So, you know, we're, we're kind of living at like maybe the beginning of really bringing AI into our lives. We have voice controlled speakers. We're talking to our phones and our laptops. And now you come with a voice controlled Spider Man. But with all of these options, there are concerns over data and privacy for adults who are knowingly making these decisions to interact with these technologies, right? What are you all doing here on Spider Man to protect kids and, and any sort of interactions they have with, with your device? Absolutely. Um, you know, and as a parent, I share that exact concern. And so, um, you know, it's really close to our to our heart. And one of our, you know, major focuses is safety and security. And in the case of Spider-Man, we really kind of built the architecture of the uh, technology around safety. So, for example, when you uh, when you first set up your your toy, he's going to you're going to set up an alias. You're going to come up with your own superhero name your own superhero power so yeah i chose danger already. dude and bionic fists for my <laughs> <Sure. Yeah, laughs> sorry so, to cut you off so we're, yeah oh no <laughs> so we're not storing any personally identifiable information ever we're not sending any personally identifiable information so we really start out with kind of this anonymized uh user who you know you're creating your own uh superhero so that you can kind of be on the same page with spidey and interact with them um the other big thing that we did was we, we do all of our speech recognition locally on the device. So when you pick it up, you can feel there's a little bit of weight to it. Oh, yeah. That's because it, feel, it feels hefty and durable. Let me see. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's, you're right. There's like a full, full blown computer inside of him. So we do all of our speech rec locally. We don't send that up to the cloud, you know, like um, a Siri or Amazon Echo or Google Home. It all happens on device. And that actually, not only does that help with, uh, reassuring parents that this is a safe toy, that there's no information being sent and received to the cloud. But it also allows kids to take it on things like road trips, like what I'm about to do for Father's Day weekend here. So you'll be able to take Spidey out of a Wi-Fi area and have mm. the full-out experience interacting with him. And yeah, so, and I've you know, noticed to use the toy, you don't need to have the app or the phone with you. I actually left him in, in my office uh, for a while <laughs> with, with my colleagues, and he was <coughs> chatting it up. So uh, he can work independently. You don't always have to give your kid your phone while giving him this toy. Absolutely. Um, we, we really you know, made an effort to make sure that you, you can, everything that you can do through the phone, you can do through voice. And in fact, there's more interactions you can do through voice. So the phone is really kind of, uh, in my opinion, we're, we're sort of giving you a, a way in, a way into this conversation and a way into this relationship that you're starting with Spider-Man. And from there, uh, as you kind of learn to interact and feel more comfortable talking to a, uh, a Spider-Man, then more stuff becomes unlocked mm -hmm. and he'll kind of lead you on into other types of interactions you can have that aren't super apparent in the app. So this specific Spider-Man, um, there's um, a mic, there's a speaker, obviously you said all the all the data processing is done locally, not being sent to the cloud. Is there a camera in here or not? Because I, I know there's the, the, the guard mode where he can actually s watch a room and if someone comes in, he'll say, hey, you're not supposed to be here. And then when you come back, you say, stand down. He'll say, oh, two people stopped by. I wasn't sure if I got them or not. You might want to do sweeps, cool stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, totally. So there, there's no camera. What we use is a, a an IR sensor that's built into the button here. It's just like a standard motion detector that you, someone would have in their house. So there's there's no camera. It's basically like the infrared sensor technology that you have in like a standard TV remote. So all it senses is, was there a change in movement? 
Mm -hmm. And so that's how that's kind of the technology behind his what we call a spider sense. So is is the toy connected to the internet at all? So when you first set him up, you you go through a setup process where you give Spidey your Wi-Fi password, your home Wi-Fi password, just as if you know a guest comes over to your house and asks to connect your Wi-Fi. Once he gets that Wi-Fi password, he pings our server, and we basically update the firmware, we update the software, and we update the content. So as long as he is still um, connected to that network, at uh, you know at late late at night when you know after midnight, if he still has an internet connection, he'll actually ping our server and say, hey, is there new content? If there is, he'll silently download it. You won't even know it happened. And then the next morning, he'll actually have new content on him. I guess and that's getting, really, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, getting back to the security issue for a minute, uh, it seemed, I, I was wondering about you know somebody hacking it <laughs> to be able to do something nefarious. Sure, so that, um, everything that we, uh, I mean, basically it'd be, totally secure because there's no interface in which someone could ever do that, mm. basically. So with these toys, one of the things, and well, really with all Sphero products, you're always making a commitment to having new content, to kind of updating stuff. And I feel like that's important to point out because the prices here are pretty high. I mean, 150 bucks, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, for, for Spider-Man, it was 300 for Lightning McQueen. Mm. But with the previous Sphero ball, the, the kind of the, the namesake and the, the logo of the company, you guys have had that around for like five years or something. Really, that long? Yeah, right? Is, am, I, am I wrong, Ryan? No, that sounds about right, yeah. And, and you guys have consistently had app updates, new games to play, new capabilities, and you've opened it up to coding so that kids, whether they're on their own or they're at school, they could download apps and actually control this. And, and you all recently um, uh, uh, got working with some, some Apple software too, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about that initiative? Um, sure, I can't go too deep into that. I don't, I'm not super hands-on with the, uh, the Spark end of that, but that's basically our EDU uh, department and they are heavily invested in education and teaching kids coding, getting involved in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what they have is, a, is an app that really lets kids, you know, get their feet wet with coding, understand what it is, and, you know, kind of empowers them to control their own robots and build their own programs. Do you uh, think we could ever see Spider-Man or Lightning McQueen opened up to the education initiatives you guys have going on? I think that's a possibility. Uh, I, we don't have any plans in the direct future that I'm aware of for either the either of those products, but it's definitely a you know a core belief that's a big part of you know Sphero's DNA is that um, that EDU and that open um, approach. And so uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we had you know more products in the future that go in that direction. All right, so with all of these toys, part of the promise and in part of justifying the prices being a little mm. bit higher than an average Spider-Man action figure or something, yeah. is that these toys will get better over time. <clears throat> um, where do you see this going, not only for Sphero, but kind of toys in general? Do you see it ever getting to a point where our toys are just kind of acting in front of us and we don't even have to touch them to play with them? <laughs> or like, where, do, where does this end and it just stops becoming like a full end? robot, right? <laughs> Sure. I mean, there's a lot in that question there. Um, I, I think for, for example, for Spider-Man, um, we're, we're trying to build products that people don't throw away after a week. Uh, we're trying to build products that people really develop um, an affinity for and a relationship with that, like you said, over time and, you know, maybe two years from now, someone that bought a Spider-Man today might wake up in the morning and have an entirely new type of experience available to them, uh, you know, at no cost at all. So really trying to pack value and pack fun and pack longevity into these products um, so that we're not just selling plastic by the pound. Um, mm -hmm. a, a, lot of the, a lot of the toys that, that you see today, you know, they're, real, they're like firecrackers. You, you light them off, they explode, and it's over. Mm -hmm. um, or we're trying to build something that's a little bit more long-lasting, a little bit more meaningful. And then also just get into, um, you know, how, how to interact the world, interact with the world. And certainly, you know, we, we've never had the idea to build toys that just play, you know, play on their own and you sit there and watch. A lot of this is about participating, right? And it's about getting your experience off the screen and into the real world. And I think that our products really, um, the, the, 
the thing that makes them special, I think, is we are trying to inspire people and and inspire imagination in the kids that play with them. I think that's beautiful. That yeah, you know, get to get kids in particular away from the screen. I mean, you've got an app, okay? Yeah, yeah. But still, you can play with this without the app. One of my questions was, how durable is it? I mean, we're talking about kids here, right? They're going to bang it around. Yeah, sure. So, so we definitely built it to be as durable as we possibly could. Um, we've we've done a lot of testing with it. We've, you know, a, a lot of the games are actually very, very active where you have to move and jump around, or you can even there's a feature where you can toss them and you make sounds. Um, so, <laughs> we, you know, it's it's. <laughs> It's fairly subjective, but I mean, pretty darn durable. When you pick it up, you can feel it. It's heavy, and uh, oh yeah, and so yes. a nice rubberized uh, uh, coating here. Mm -hmm. You know, I beat I beat up your Lightning McQueen. I've been been using this thing, and the front bumper's got a little bit of scuff, but not much. It almost looks <laughs> new, and I've literally been driving it into walls on purpose to see how durable it is. Oh, that's great. These are some. You guys make some <laughs> of the most durable toys. It seems. Awesome. Um, now, we'll ask you a, a, one last question here before we let you go. Really appreciate you giving us so much time, but Disney is an investor of Sphero, and we see here two Disney-inspired toys. You're still making your own products that come outside of the you know, Disney creative space, but what's the future of Sphero look like? Are you guys going to be making more Avengers-type stuff, some Star Wars stuff, or are you really going to be kind of going back and having a balance of you know, original Sphero ideas and some Disney ideas? Sure. Uh, great question. Um, you know, honestly, this is the funnest place in the world to work. The types of ideas and the types of products that I see around here every day are just mind blowing. Um, I think at any given time, you could probably guesstimate there's maybe 50 possible products being prototyped and played with and tested. And so, you know, Disney, uh, as great of a partner as they are, they're really the sky's the limit with with what we can do and what we can build here. And I think that we we're investigating, you know, a diversified product portfolio with uh, different partners, different licenses, and then of course all of our own IP um, that we're going to develop. So I think over the next, you know, two to three years, we're going to start seeing a lot of really fun stuff coming out of Sphero. Oh man, I'm really looking forward to that, Ryan. Thank you so much for giving you uh, giving us your time. If people want to pick these up, where can they get them? You know, the best place to go is just Sphero.com. All right, great. And with that, we'll let you go. And next thank up. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Next All up. Right, take care. All righty, catch you later. Next up, Megan Maroney has a first look at the iPad Pro, the mm. 10 and a half inch model. Uh, let's go to that. While Leo is off enjoying some well deserved family time, I had a chance to usurp the 10.5 inch iPad Pro that he ordered for himself. And I got to take it for a little spin before he came back from vacation. Here are my first thoughts. It is beautiful and it is, as many have already said, truly the baby bear bed of iPad Pros. Not too big, not too small, but just right. And Apple made it even more perfect for Goldilocks by making the screen bigger and the bezels thinner. Everyone knows that Goldilocks loves those thin bezels. Goldilocks also likes a slightly bigger keyboard. Apple says that they made a 10.5 inch iPad so it could have a full size keyboard. This isn't exactly what I would call a full size keyboard, but it is bigger than the 9.5 iPad Pro. Other than that, it looks a lot like your standard iPad. Here is how two of the iPad Pros compare from a physical perspective. This iPad doesn't have cellular capabilities, so no antenna lines. For a brief moment, when I first opened the iPad, I was convinced I'd scratched it, but apparently these tiny holes were meant to be there. As for the specs, swiping and opening and browsing seems faster on the new iPad Pro, and it should be. The new one is almost as powerful as a MacBook with a new and improved ATX Fusion chip. Plus, there's four gigs of RAM built in iOS 11 will bring with it new ways to organize, view, and access your files, plus improved multitasking and split screen features. But keep in mind, iOS 11 isn't out yet, and the public beta won't even be available until later this summer. The display is beautiful, no doubt about it. The new 120 hertz ProMotion display automatically ups the refresh rate. The old mama and papa bear iPad Pros were limited to a 60 hertz refresh rate. Even better, the chip in the new iPad Pro is smart enough to know if I'm surfing the web, watching a movie, or reading an ebook, and it adjusts the frame rate accordingly. 
The older iPad Pros also have retina displays, but improved refresh rate makes everything even better. I wanted to take the screen off and see for myself what's inside the new iPad to make the picture so great, but since it's Leo's, I decided to depend on other teardowns that have been posted online. And it turns out that there are not two, but four connecting cables between the display and the hardware inside. The price. What I've always said about any of the iPad Pros is that for me, the price only makes sense if you compare it to a laptop. $900 doesn't seem like that much if you're comparing it to an $1,800 MacBook that has about the same power. If you love the iPad form factor and you've always wanted to buy one, but you haven't been able to justify it, this might be the right time for you. If you think you'll use it mostly for consuming content at home, I would probably go with that newer 12.9 inch iPad Pro, the biggest one, the Papa Bear. If you like rose gold, however, you'll have to stick to one of the smaller sizes because the 12.9 inch only comes in gold, space gray, and silver. Bottom line, if you've already bought one or both of the previous size iPad Pros and you are not Leo, upgrading to this iPad Pro just to get a slightly bigger display, more power, more RAM, and smaller bezels doesn't make a lot of sense from an economic perspective. If you've convinced yourself that you need to upgrade to this iPad Pro to utilize all the features of iOS 11, then you might at least wait until iOS 11 is out and try it on your current iPad to see if it lives up to the promise of the demo at WWDC. I am Megan Maroney, and I host Tech News Today every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific with Jason Howell, and iOS Today every Monday around 1.30 with Leo Laporte. Speaking of Leo, he'll be back, so I'm going to wrap this iPad of his back up. And, well, you know what? They're almost the same size. I don't think he'll notice. Shh. Down. All right. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, we we have the evidence, Megan. We, we do. Trying to pull a fast one. All right. <laughs> well, from a new iPad to a new Surface device, let's talk about the Microsoft Surface laptop. This is Microsoft's first actual clamshell laptop. You know, there's stuff before it really been like a tablet with a det detachable keyboard kind and all a, that. A, 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 what did they call it? Convertible. Exactly, exactly. So this starts at 999 bucks. Oh, not smokes. cheap. No, mm -hmm. not cheap. And that's if you want it with an Intel Core i5, 125, or 128 gigabyte SSD, 4 gigs of RAM, and Intel integrated graphics, uh, their HD graphics 620. So it's not going to have a discrete graphics card. So if you're getting into video editing or anything like that, this, this ain't the, the laptop for you. Yeah. This model that we got right here is actually 1300 bucks. Leo ordered this one. And uh, just like Megan, I unboxed it since he was out. I've been trying it out for the last uh, uh, you know, couple days. There is a more expensive model that goes up to 2200 bucks with an Core i7, uh, 512 Man. gigabyte SSD, and 16 gigs of RAM. But I gotta say, a thousand bucks, Microsoft has been, has been saying that this was aimed at students. What? And a thousand bucks is a lot of, a lot of money a lot for of a lot of money for a student. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we're into Apple territory here, really. Exactly. This is pretty much uh, a MacBook Air equivalent. Mm -hmm. and, and as you can see from the styling and everything like that, it not really... Not much in the way of connectors. No, not much in the way of connectors. It's really an Ultrabook. So on this mm -hmm. side, you have its charging port. Right. And then on this side here, this is one of my biggest complaints. It's, an, it's a regular USB port. I wanted USB-C. Now, I understand that... You might have to carry around a dongle for a bit, but if I'm going to buy this, especially if I'm a student, I'm going to have it for like five years or so, and this port's going to be outdated in the next couple. Then you got this display port here if you want to hook it up to a monitor. Mm -hmm. If they would have given you a regular traditional uh, USB and then a USB-C, <coughs> the USB-C could have handled the, uh, the video output, and it can handle data, and then you'd have the option of both. So mm. that'll be my biggest gripe here, but... Tell me, what do you think of this Alcantara? This is you know, a similar material to what I have on the dash of my car, or my <laughs> Toyota. I once had a, a laptop that, that had an extra sort of piece of something that felt kind of like this on this area. Yeah. Um, I kind of liked it, and I like this too, but you brought up earlier a really good point. How long is this going to last? Yeah, you might have a laptop for about five years, and it's comfortable when you're when you're typing, you know, you're throwing your wrist on there. That's a little bit nicer than mm -hmm. aluminum or mm -hmm. some kind of cold steel or something. Yeah. But, um, you know, and I've just spent a couple days with it, but we've already seen from other reviews people getting stains on it and things looking a little worn after about a week. I'm also concerned of fraying on the edges here. It would be nice if this was maybe a removable piece so that you could swap it out every couple mm -hmm, of years, maybe some mm -hmm. different colors. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a bold decision, and I gotta give Microsoft some props for doing something different, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if this was the right move to do <laughs> in the long run. Well, 
well, you know, you got to experiment. Yeah, you got to experiment. The the trackpad and the keyboard do feel pretty great, though. They do. I was just typing a little bit on this keyboard, and you know, that's my business typing. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it, it feels pretty good. I like it. Yeah, and it still has a touch screen, mm -hmm. although, and it works with the Surface Pen, although. You know, it's a little bit of the gorilla arm kind of, it's just your arm's going to get tired of reaching across there. Yeah. So it's not the most ideal, but what it's is the nice weight? to have the option. Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure what the weight is. I should have wrote that down on the spec sheet, yeah, and I did not. Yeah, because it doesn't feel too bad. No, it's pretty light. It's it's definitely MacBook Air weight. Yeah. In, in, in at least it feels that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so overall, a pretty interesting laptop. I'm not, you know, didn't have time for a full review. Haven't put it through all the battery tests and those sorts of things. Yeah. But out the box, it comes with what's called uh, Windows 10 S. And some have said that this is kind of Microsoft's answer to Chrome OS. Mm. What it does, I'm not to sure I totally agree with that. What it does is it locks you into downloading apps from the Windows App Store. The problem with that is most of the apps that I want, personally, aren't on the Windows <laughs> App Store. So you're not going to get Chrome. Mm -hmm. You're going to be locked into Edge as your uh, default browser. Mm -hmm. I can't say I'm a big fan of Edge. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get full-blown Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Illustrator apps that I use. Uh -huh. um, and, and you can't even get something like Spotify in here. So, what? Yeah, so I'm hoping over time that you know, maybe this is a strong arm move to muscle developers and big names to get apps in here, but it's pretty but lackluster. Again, it sounds like an Apple move. You know, you can only get app, Apple apps from the Apple App Store. Exactly, and that makes sense for iOS, but Apple isn't yet doing that on the Mac. Mm. And the difference, of course, is Apple's App Store is loaded up with great apps, mm. and Microsoft isn't there yet. So hopefully that changes, but by the end of the year, before the end of the year, anyone who buys one of these can upgrade to the regular version of Windows 10. Now. Um, again, I'm still using it. Why are they doing that? You know, I'm not sure. I, I, I kind of wish they would just give you regular Windows 10 out the gate. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me if they're going to give it to you at some point. Exactly, right? Or if you wait until, like, next year. I don't know why you would if you bought one of these, but if you waited that long, it'll cost you 49 bucks to upgrade to regular Windows 10. So I think if you get one of these, the first thing you should do, <laughs> at least until Microsoft can get their, uh, their uh, App Store bulked up. Yeah. Yep, but that is the Microsoft Surface Laptop. It comes in this... Really nice really looking nice. burgundy. It yeah. kind of matches your shirt. It kind of works out pretty good. Look at good. that. Yeah, it's that's great. great. Um, and it's also a navy, a gold, and a silver color. Mm. Um, I'd like to see the navy in person. Um, but at least at least you won't look like all the other silver laptops <laughs> in your class if you are one of those students who can afford this thing. Yeah, well, that's the big question, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, we're going to take a deep dive into UHD. Ooh, my in, favorite topic. Yeah, in our call for help. But first, Georgia Dow of anxiety-videos.com has a quick tip on how you can use tech to get a better night's sleep. Hi, I'm Georgia from iMore. And right now, we're going to be talking a little bit about sleep. Getting good quality of sleep is really important. And everyone always asks me, how do I get better sleep using my technology? A great tip one would be making sure that you put on do not disturb so that your phone doesn't blink, beep, or buzz throughout the middle of the night. Another tip would be, if you can actually, would be turning off all technology before you go to bed for like 30 to 45 minutes before you go to sleep. But if you're like me and you're going to be really addicted to your phone and just have to check out some of the last tweets or websites, then what you should be doing is you should put your phone on flux or night shift, which is going to change the spectrum of light from going to blue spectrum light into more of a yellow color. Put it on full capacity. Don't worry. It's going to look annoying at first, but eventually your eyes are going to get completely used to it. If you're still awake and you're having problems, you could do something that's kind of distracting, but not too exciting. Then, something great to be able to track your sleep cycles would be Sleep Cycle Counter. So you end up looking for the app called Sleep Cycle, put it underneath your bed, and then it will track how well am I actually sleeping each night. If you like this video, you can check out me on anxiety-videos.com, or of course, ask me a question on Twitter, at Georgia underscore Dow. All right, thanks, Georgia. She's always fantastic. Now it's time for the call for help. All right, I'm excited. You're going to show <laughs> off your expertise here, flex some muscles here. Uh, we got Nick in Gladstone um, from Queensland, Australia. He's a returning caller, and he has what looks like the coolest, what is that, is Transformers and Gundam back there? What do you got? 
Uh, Transformers. Transformers. I love it. Very cool, man. Super cool. All right, Nick, so let's get right into it. This is your moment. Ask your question. Okay, so as Scott's been going over on his um, podcast for the last, you know, however many years it's been going on, (laughs) um, yeah, there's three kind of things that are coming for UHD. There's... 4K resolution, which we've had for a while now. There's HDR, which is the last couple of years, and there's meant to be 2020 color gamut. Mm-hmm. But um, currently, the best displays on the market for consumers are only DCI P3. Now, um, I've heard that. The human eye is actually not that good at seeing the difference between uh, different shades of colour. So I'm wondering if I do get a new gaming display or um, or TV that are DCI P3, am I going to then see a 2020 screen and go, "Oh my God, I wasted my money. <laughs> Why did I buy that?" The answer is no. You will not waste your money. We are several years away from displays that can do this range of colors called a color gamut, uh, which is referred to by this number 2020. Uh, And you're correct that what we see now in TVs and in fact in commercial cinema is called DCI, Digital Cinema Initiative P3, which is a somewhat less, a uh, somewhat smaller range of colors, but it's larger than what we're used to with high definition, with Blu-ray, mm-hmm. broadcasting, everything we've seen up till recently has been in, in another color gamut called 709, which is smaller still. So expanding out to P3 is, is significant. Now you're right that the human visual system, you know, to tell the difference between this shade of green and that shade of green, that if they're close together, is is not necessarily that good. We certainly don't have as good um, perception of resolution in color as we do in black and white. Uh, but be that as it may, that's resolution. What we're talking here about is the range of colors. And even 2020 is does not represent all the colors that humans can see. It's still a subset of all the colors that humans can see. Now, we're not going to have displays that can do 2020 Uh, for several years. The only way to do it currently is with a laser projector that uses red, green, and blue lasers, um, or the possibility of using these things called quantum dots. And we have several TVs on the market now with quantum dots. Yeah, yeah. Samsung's been pushing that, Samsung's been pushing that with with QLED. Uh, LG has it, Uh a sort of a different kind of flavor to it. Sony has has used it. Vizio used it in their reference series. Okay. And quantum dots can get pretty close to 2020. They're not quite there yet. They're mm-hmm, still mm-hmm. in development, uh, but they have been used in TVs to get to P3, to get to this larger than HD but smaller than 2020. <laughs> Which is what allows you to get the HDR. Uh, well, that's and all part that of stuff? it. Part of HDR as well. Yes. Okay. And okay. as you and I said earlier, that uh, HDR is what's critically important uh, for really seeing a big improvement in Mm -hmm. picture quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's with gaming consoles uh, displays as well as uh, TVs. So the the answer to your question is don't worry about waiting for 2020 uh, because it's going to be a few years. There's another problem with 2020 that, that people don't often recognize, which is that when one person looks at a screen, say say you had a TV that could really reproduce 2020. Uh-huh. One, it, you and I are both looking at that screen. We're not necessarily going to say we see the exact same color. Mm-hmm. Because because of the way that our eyes work. Because of the way that, the, that our eyes work and because of the spectrum mm-hmm. of, of that color space. Now with an OLED TV or an LCD TV, the TVs we have today, the spectrum is very broad. It, it encompasses a wide range of colors continuously. 2020 would have a sharp spike at red, a Mm -hmm. sharp spike at green, and a sharp spike at blue, and nothing in between. That leads to a weird effect called metamerism. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Which basically says if you have a, a, that's your spectrum with tiny sharp spikes, you and I might not see the same pic, might might not see exactly the same color. Interesting, interesting. 
I wouldn't even necessarily say that a 2020 display is even better. Better. Really? Yeah. So 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 when you say that 2020 is a few few years off, yeah. and Nick and I'm actually thinking about buying a new TV, Nick. So I really love your question here. <laughs> but if Nick and I can buy a TV with confidence today, yeah. and not feel like we're cheating ourselves in like what five or ten years, is that how long we're talking about? Well, I or? think we're talking at least five. Okay, at, at least, least five. At least five. I mean, I, you know, who knows? But there's an ongoing debate over when that does show up in five years, mm. if it will actually be better than what we can buy today. Because not only do you have a, t you, do you need a TV that can do it, you need content content that has it. That matches it, yeah. That matches yeah, it. Yeah. And all the content that's being released today <laughs> in the commercial cinema and in on uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray yeah. is this P3. This seems like a never-ending <coughs> cycle because, you know, at first we had an HD mm. and everything was coming out in 720, even HD TV. You weren't getting a lot of 1080p stuff. Now we got 4K. Yep. Still don't have a ton of 4K content. And now well, we but have it's growing. HDR. It's growing. But this seems to be like kind of like a never-ending. This is just the chicken and egg. It's just how it works, isn't right? Isn't that the way of all tech? Yeah, really. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's always going to be some improvement down the road. Okay. And so, so there's there's no future proofing we have to think about for 2020 today. Really. I don't think so. I mean, no no display you have to. It's not like it could be updated with a firmware update yeah, or something yeah. like that. <laughs> the that OLED isn't the answer or something. It, huh? it isn't really. Okay. I mean, okay. it's going to be. Only, as I said, RGB laser projection. If you go to a Dolby Cinema, yeah, you know, with uh, with Dolby Vision high dynamic range, that's RGB laser. Okay. And there have been a couple of movies that were that had some 2020 in them. You remember Inside Out? Yeah, uh, there gorgeous was one, film. Gorgeous film, beautiful. One scene where they're in the deepest, darkest subconscious, and the the birthday clown is there, yeah. and they're all scared. That was shown in. 2020. Wait, wait, wait. That one specific that scene was 2020 and the rest of the movie wasn't? Correct. The rest of the movie was P3. <laughs> it's like it's like when you go and there was one scene in IMAX or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, I wouldn't worry about a future proofing with 2020. It's You're going to be perfectly fine with a P3, 4K, HDR. HDR is the important thing. And you really can't get that on anything but a 4K display. You, yep. you know, 1080p displays today don't have HDR. They're right. talking about yeah, as it. But they're they're not there yet. Yeah, as a gamer, there's one other thing that's important, and that's frame rates. Mm. You've got displays now that are going up to 240 hertz. So also looking at that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's again that's another great question, and I think frame rate is also more important than pixel resolution. Uh -huh. um, for example, there's only one movie out now that was shot at something higher than 24 frames per second, and that's Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, okay. Ang Lee's latest movie. It was shot at 120 frames per second. Wow. The Ultra HD Blu-ray is at 60 frames per second, so they mm -hmm. cut it in half. Mm -hmm. Still, it looks very different. Does it have that kind of like video-like look? It, in a sense, it does, but unlike frame interpolation, which gives you really that video look, uh -huh. this has actual 60 frames per second yeah. in it. So it's not your TV inserting a frame that doesn't exist. Correct, correct. It's the real deal. And it, you know, the pans, the motion, yeah. just looks so sharp, so crisp and clean. I love it. Uh, so I hope more movie makers follow Ang Lee's lead there. But that's kind of a stylistic choice, right? I mean, it is. Filmmakers, it is. a lot of them, I can't speak for everyone, of course, <laughs> but a lot of them say they want film to look like film. I know. And these digital formats, red cameras and all that, they're yep. giving us something different. They are. An option, I guess. They are. And there are a few directors um, who insist on using film. Yeah. Uh, Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino, um, Oliver Stone, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly J.J. Abrams, I believe, is yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. they're keeping Kodak alive. They're keeping Kodak alive by themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but I myself uh, I'm perfectly happy with digital imagery. I'm I'm very happy with higher frame rates. Embracing I hope the we future. see more of that. Embracing the future. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier about the Xbox One X and how you know it can go up to 60 frames per second on gaming. Uh, and if if you have a game that has that capability, yeah. then yeah. you're going to see something really special. Similarly, when you have a movie with that, you're going to see something special. Uh, but uh, other than that one movie. Hopefully there will be more in the future, but uh, for now that's the only one. Otherwise, you get these TVs with 120 uh, hertz or 240 hertz. They're going to insert a bunch of synthesized frames mm -hmm. in between the actual frames of a movie or a TV. Uh, and that will give you this thing called the soap opera effect. It makes it look like a video rather than a movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a lot of people don't like that. I just finished a review of an LG OLED TV 
where if you didn't do that, if you turned that off, the 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 motion was oh. very juddery. Oh, not good. Not, not good. good. So yeah. really, on that LG, you have to turn it on, or else you're going to drive yourself nuts. All right. Awesome, Nick. Yeah, is I that actually. Yeah, th uh, that uh, LG, I've still got to watch your episode of Home Theater Geeks on it, but that's the lowest end LG model that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely I'll, I'll check that out. It's definitely a great TV. I, my, my review of it is very positive. Just I, keep that, that on. Just basically. keep that on, and if you really hate soap opera effect, if that is more important to you yeah. than a smooth motion, don't then that the might TV. that might not be the TV for you, but otherwise, in every other way, it performs beautifully. All right, Nick, did we get you taken care of here? Oh yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Nick, a return question asker. Thank you so much for watching. And yeah, support. thanks, man. All right, so next week we're going to have Florence Ion on, and she'll be able to answer your questions. She's an Android expert. Ooh. So if you've got some Android-specific questions, throw those at us. And if you want to answer, ask any tech questions, here's how. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. All right, Scott, I feel like I could talk with you about TVs and home <laughs> theater stuff for like hours. We're going to have more in the mailbag, uh, but cool, first we're going to go to Brian Burnett, who has a review of the Neato uh, BotVac connected Wi-Fi enabled robot vacuum. He also has an adorable Corgi. Let's see if this vacuum robot can handle his Corgi's fur. This is Brian Burnett from Know How taking a look at the Neato Bot Vac Connected, which is a robot vacuum that connects to your Wi-Fi, otherwise known as a glorified dustbuster. Now this vacuum comes in at $699 and well, appearance wise, it's very similar to many other robots on the market. Uh, it's kind of a black wedge that will roam around your house and do some of the dust busting that in an automated fashion that you don't want to have to do. Also, an added benefit of the BotVac is that it frightens corgis. He is not a fan. Sorry, Tibbs. On the front of the BotVac, you have a bumper that it uses to sense into things that it has bumped into, but also there are two buttons that allow you to change into different modes that the BotVac has, like, like cleaning in a circle or being able to send it back home. But as you'll notice, there are a lot of scratches on the BotVac. This thing really beats itself up as it runs into furniture. On the bottom side of the BotVac, you see the powerful tread wheels that allow it to traverse most obstacles in the house. But one downside that I had with this uh, vacuum is it's not easy to get the brush out, uh, and it does collect a lot of hair in there. Uh, the Neato comes with what it calls BotVac Vision, but really that just means it has a bumper in the front that bumps into things and sometimes sees where it's going. Now the small display is not very intuitive for navigation, but will allow you to change settings, add a schedule, and more irritatingly, not be able to update the firmware without actually downloading it to a USB from your computer and then plugging it into the bot vac. So connecting to the Wi-Fi basically just allows you to start or stop the bot vac or be alerted to whenever it gets stuck on something which happened to me a few times as there's a corner in my house which i now dub the dead zone where the bot vac would get stuck on one of uh, some of my furniture now as far as the dust bin it does collect quite a bit of corgi hair and does a good job of uh, pulling off up debris from the carpet but unfortunately with this design the filter is a part of the tray which does make things a lot more messy when you're trying to empty the tray and keep the filter clean now the top down view of the bot vac oh sorry this isn't the bot vac this is my scale which is very similar to looking to the bot vac um by the end of using the bot vac for a month you can tell it really got beat up uh around the house some of the things i like about the bot vac is that the interface is relatively easy to use with the software when you have it on your phone it's available for android and ios and the maps that it comes up with from going around your house are pretty accurate and well detailed so you can get an idea of where the bot vac has been and where you need to vacuum yourself in case it can't get to the other nooks and crannies of your house. 
In the end, the botvac has some highlights like long battery life and decent sucking power, but it's hard for me to recommend it at $700. If you find it on discount, it may be worth it to you. Otherwise, uh, maybe keep on looking. This has been Brian Burnett, host of Know How. Thanks for watching. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen corgi fur balls quite like that. That was, that was pretty good. Thank you, pretty Brian. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, thank you, Brian, for taking taking one from the team there and doing that. All right, it's time for the mailbag. Let's mailbag. see. Mailbag. All right, and I think, you know, we we announced that that you were coming on last last episode. And there were so many questions. I mean, I th people just like they, they love you, you know. So <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and I think it's to the point they probably you know need information about the home theater stuff. Yeah, well, it used to be you buy a TV, right, and that's yeah. it. Now there's so much more to think about. There's so much more, and it seems like you know you bring Wi-Fi and smart features into it, and yep. you know sublimated uh, surround and all sorts yeah, of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So uh, we really appreciate you coming on. I think both these questions are going to be uh, two that, that you'll be able to handle. You want to read the first one? Sure. Hey guys, I'm remodeling my living room and I'm moving all my AV gear into an AV cabinet about 20 feet away. I presume 20 feet away from the TV or That's the display. That's what it sounds like, yeah. <clears throat> I want to be able to run 4K HDR content. Do I need to buy a special cable? Should I run an HDMI, Ethernet HDMI system? Uh, this is from Kyle. And I wonder if he's doing that because he's like, you know, wall mounting a TV or something, want a clean look, get it out of there? Or? Well, I mean, if he's remodeling his living room and he's got a, you know, he wants to put the stuff in a cabinet, make mm -hmm. it look a little nicer, mm -hmm. maybe it was just sort of piled up someplace, yeah. hard to yeah. say. Um, but really the question is, what about an HDMI 20-foot run, a 20-foot HDMI cable? Is that going to handle uh, 4K HDR content? And the answer is, it's right on the borderline. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so in this instance, the length matters, huh? It does. It matters a lot, especially 4K HDR. First of all, you need to make sure that you get a cable that is rated for the top speed of HDMI, which mm -hmm. is 18 gigabits per second. Okay. Okay. So as long as you make sure that you have a cable that can carry that reasonably, that's the first step. Second step is 20 feet. You can buy 20 foot long HDMI cables. I even use one myself. Okay. Um, but it it's uh, it's it's on the borderline of, okay. of what's of what works. Now this being digital, it'll either work or it won't. So so he'll be able to tell right and, away. And if he needs to make a new purchase, <laughs> right? Okay. Right. Uh, occasionally you'll get what are called sparklies, oh, okay. uh, what are little little light. B bright little dots kind of dancing around. Yeah. Um, those can be extremely distracting. Really distracting. You yeah. don't want that. So there's two ways to go. One is, as he says, what's called a Balun system. B-A-L-U-N stands for balanced, unbalanced. What it means is short little HDMI cable to a little box, mm -hmm. Ethernet to another little box. Because and Ethernet cable can be any length. And basically the thinking is Ethernet, big data pipe, you can get stuff through quick. Easy. No obstructions. No problem. You could also do it with fiber optics. Okay. Is another way to go. Good to know. And then another little box at the receiving end, a short little HDMI cable to your display. That'll work great. Mm -hmm. They ain't cheap. Mm. Uh, so so that might be the reason why you might want to try out the 20-foot cable first for exactly, HDMI? Exactly. Because that's probably going to be less expensive. Yes. Now, there is an interim solution as well, which is called an active HDMI cable. It's a full HDMI cable, but it has <clears throat> a little booster in it, a little mm. circuit in, mm. I forget whether it's the source end or the receiving end, one of the two, uh, probably the source end, that has a little booster in it that kind of boosts things along. Okay. And so Monoprice makes those. I think you can get them from Amazon as well, Amazon Basics. Uh, so there are a number of companies that do that. Those are a little more expensive than just passive HDMI cables, but they're not as expensive as these Balin systems. So, so when you see an HDMI cable and it says supports Ethernet, that's what it's telling you is, hey, well, I'm the middle solution here? No, no. Because <laughs> um, I see that and I always think, well, yeah. what? <laughs> HDMI has gone through a number of revisions, mm -hmm. right, or version mm -hmm. numbers, shall we yeah. say. There's 1.4, there's 2.0, we're waiting for 2.1, it hasn't come out yet. Um, and 2.0, there's an A and a B, and I honestly can't remember which is which, but one of them can actually carry Ethernet data Interesting. In the HDMI cable. Both. Yeah. And, and, and would that be able to? No. No. 
No, don't play with that here. <laughs> don't worry about that. That's okay. <laughs> I think that that's a, a sort of a feature looking for, uh, I mean, a, an answer looking for a problem. I get you. I can't imagine sending Ethernet data along an, Ether, uh, along an HDMI, <laughs> HDMI cable, cable myself. Yeah. There may be a use for it. I can't think of one off the top of my head. No. What we're talking about here is you have to buy what's called a Balin system. So it's going to have two little boxes, mm -hmm, and it's going to mm -hmm. have uh, an Ethernet cable. You put an Ethernet cable between them or a fiber optic cable. Um, you know, those are in the hundreds of dollars. Okay, so so it sounds like Kyle needs to try one of those 20-foot HDMIs first. Yep. Max out the speed at what? You said? 18 gigabits. 18 gigabits. And then if that doesn't work for you, if you're seeing the sparklies, mm -hmm. then go spend the hundreds of dollars on well, the Well, actually, there's Bailey? three There's three levels. One oh, is just okay. get a p passive HDMI cable 20 feet long. Okay. See if it works. I would... Be, I would not be sure that that would work. How much? How much would he be spending on that? Because you know, well, twenty foot Ethernet cable, passive Ethernet cable for monoprice is probably ten or twenty bucks. Okay, not it's bad. Not bad. So it's, that's an inexpensive place <coughs> to start. Yeah. If it doesn't work, you're not going to feel burned. If it doesn't work, go to the next step, which is an active HDMI cable. Okay. Which uh, typically uses a technology which is called Redmere. R E D M E R E. Okay. Uh, so look for that name. And you'll, you'll know that it's a, an active HDMI cable. Get a 20-footer of those, see if that works. Mm -hmm. That'll be maybe 30, 40 bucks. Okay. Maybe. Still not terrible Still not terrible. If that doesn't work, then go for this Balin system, which is going to be a lot more expensive. And probably a couple hundred bucks on that? Probably, yeah. Something along those lines. Okay. All right. Great advice. Great advice. The next question, this one comes from Ron. It says, hi, right now I have a couple of Panasonic's flat panel 1080p plasma TVs, just like me, actually. <laughs> I Great also, TV, by the way. They, they, they've held up for a long time. Yeah. I also have a large collection of Blu-ray discs. Mm -hmm. I'm itchy to buy Panasonic's new DMP UB900 4K player. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that it would upgrade my standard Blu-ray discs. People have told me that it won't. That, for me to see an improvement, I would have to buy... Or, sorry. That, for me to see an improvement, I would have to buy an Ultra 4K TV. Is this correct? Would I be wasting my money if I buy the Blu-ray player? So it sounds like he's he wants to go 4K, mm -hmm. or at least wants he wants to get the best he can get, right? right? So buy the 4K player. Will that look better on a 1080p TV? Nope. So you got to have both. You got to have yep. the 4K TV and the 4K player. If you get the 4K player and you got a bunch of Blu-rays and you yep. play them on this 4K player, which it'll play perfectly well. Yeah. And you play it on a 1080p TV. You won't notice a difference. You won't notice any difference. What if he has the 1080p Blu-rays, mm -hmm. regular Blu-rays, mm -hmm. he's got the 4K player, mm -hmm. and he decides to buy the 4K TV, mm -hmm. will that make the 1080p discs look better or not? <sighs> Marginally. Okay. And the reason is that the player or the TV, you can have it do either one, and, and there's a way to sort of test and see which one does a better job, will perform a process called upscaling, mm -hmm. right? So it'll take the 1080p and it'll upscale it to 4K. And then the TV will play it, will we'll display the, that extra. But again, like the frame interpolation that we were talking about earlier, yeah, yeah. it's adding pixels that aren't in the original signal. Yeah, it's making decisions on what this should look like at precisely, 4K that precisely. don't come from the creators. Now, right? to be fair, mm -hmm. the upscaler, modern upscalers are really good. Okay. They work really, really well. So. Yeah. Um, I think you would see a marginal improvement. You won't see high dynamic range unless you have the TV simulate that, mm -hmm. right? And I've seen some examples of that on the LG OLED, for example. Uh, it does a reasonably good job, but it's not good enough. It looks a little garish to me, yeah. let's put it that way. Yeah. So I'll watch Blu-rays in their normal standard dynamic range. I'm a big fan of watching things as the director intended. Yeah, well, you know, it sounds like he's invested in his Blu-ray disc exactly. library here, yeah. and those Blu-rays are built for 1080, <coughs> mm -hmm. so he's got the TV for that media library. Yep. If you want to go 4K, might be a good idea to 
upgrade your disc library to the 4K Blu-rays too? Well, or? yeah, I mean, yes. That's an investment. Yes, that is a good idea, but it's an investment, and it's it continually brings up the, oh, man, i got to buy the White Album again. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the musical world. Yeah. But in the movie world, if you've got a big collection of Blu-rays, yep. you know, are you going to replace them all with Ultra HD Blu-rays, really? Yeah, how I mean, many times are you going to buy Star to, Wars? Yeah, how whatever, many times right? are you going to buy Star Wars? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. the same sort of deal. VHS, Laserdisc, Blu-ray. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <You> got, <laughs> right? I know plenty of people who have large laser disc collections yeah you know? yeah, yeah but uh the answer is it the 4k player is not going to give you anything unless and until you get a 4k display okay makes then sense. then you'll get a marginal improvement on your blu-rays and what you'll then want to do from that point forward is to buy ultra hd blu-rays yeah which will look yeah. a lot better Suddenly, this upgrade just keeps getting more and more expensive. Uh, Sorry, Ron. Upgrade-itis. Sorry, Ron. This is just <laughs> how it works, man. I'm in a similar position. I'm going to be TV shopping soon. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for coming on and lending your expertise. My thank pleasure. If people want to follow you online and check out your shows and podcasts, how do they do that? Well, I'm, uh, I'm all over the Internet, I guess, these days. Uh, my website is avsforum.com, which is where I do most of my work. And uh, you can see me there every day. Uh, my podcast here on the Twit Network is uh, Home Theater Geeks. Records on Thursdays uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific time. And you can follow live. I, I interact with the chat room on the show quite a bit. In fact, there's there we go. Uh, and I make, make sure to answer questions from the chat room. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at AVS Forum. We post there all the time. And uh, so, yeah, you can also email me at scott at twit.tv. If you've got a question, uh, I, I'm always looking for listener and reader questions to uh, answer in any and all varieties. Awesome. This show here is uh, recorded live at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and 2200 UTC. And if you want to be in the audience, we love having people come out for the show in person. Mm -hmm. Email tickets at twit.tv, and you can sit and watch really any of our shows. It's it's pretty good time. By the way, it's free. It is free. We I'm just glad wanna, you mentioned that. We just want to make sure to know if somebody's coming. Yeah, just give us the heads up. <laughs> but but we, you know, we've accepted walk-ins from time to time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. If, if you want to watch live, you can check us out at twit.tv slash live. And if you want to subscribe or download our shows, you just go to twit.tv slash NSS. Also, we have, we have some newsletters. Uh, oh, that's right. Twit has now started with newsletters. I like it. Yeah, I hope, I hope you're subscribing. Absolutely. <laughs> if you want to sign up to those, you just go to twit.tv slash newsletters. And you can get all the inside news, announcements, and updates on future shows. Good stuff. Yeah. All right, Scott, with that, we are going to end this episode. Uh, Leo will be back next week from his vacation. We're excited at having him oh, back. Oh, man, I can't wait to see some of those pictures he must have been taking. Right yeah, now. yeah, uh, that'll be good. That'll be good. Uh, but, yeah, thanks again for joining us. No problem at all. All right. Yeah.